Can I just ask a small favour of you? If there are any empty seats in the middle of rows, could everybody just squeeze in? Because we've still got a few people coming in, and I think we're going to fill the hall tonight, which is a really good thing. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Have we filled? I think we've taken every seat in the building, so if you're standing, I apologise, but I hope you'll be comfortable and able enough to see. If anyone wants to come and sit, stand, or sit along the sides closer to the screen down here, please come, please do. <coughs> um, can I say I'm immensely flattered and impressed by the amount of people that have turned out tonight. It's truly amazing, so um, I hope I'm going to interest you as much as you interest me. <laughs> Thank you. Right. If I can uh, start by thanking Haverbury Homes for um, arranging my presence here tonight. Um, my name is Andy Beachy. Um, I work for a company called Archaeological Solutions. Um, we're based in Bury St Edmunds and it was immensely interesting to be involved in these projects in Great Northern Ethan. Um, I'm going to try and take you through two sites and how they sit with parts of Roman Britain and parts of Roman tradition this evening, and afterwards when I turn the lights up, if everyone is fairly um, calm, not too rowdy, you don't look riotous, um, I'll turn the lights up and I have a selection of finds on a couple of tables at the front here if everyone would like to have a walk around. It's a mixture of pottery, of jewellery, of coins, some of which was found on the site, some of which is from Suffolk, and some of which are reproductions to help bring this to life to a bit. But the difference is, it's not behind glass in a museum, and it's all here for you to look at very closely and handle. Um, so please feel free and stick around afterwards. I'll take questions after the talk, and I'll try and hang around a bit for whoever wants to talk to an archaeologist as well. Right, um, I'm going to start a talk on local Great Longneatham, a long way away in time and place, um, about 1,400 kilometres to the southeast, exactly, around Rome and Naples. Um, specifically around Pompeii. Um, you'll see my title here tonight, Memento Mori. Um, we are at the frontier province of a very sprawling classical empire that was centred on the Mediterranean. And what I want to do with this phrase is begin to highlight the lifestyle, the belief and the laws that connect Naples, Rome and this distant centre with the frontier province of Great Monetha. Um, this mosaic, designed to depict Memento Mori, was displayed in an upper-class dining room in a house in Pompeii, um, subsequently covered by a volcano. It's a Latin phrase that literally means, remember that you will die. It's not quite as grim as it seems. Um, it was actually, in the Roman period, quite a positive, life-affirming reminder of morality. Um, it was often quoted in comedic plays to the public, and it was designed to remind you to live a good life so you would have a good afterlife. Um, it's a reminder that death was a great leveller. It didn't matter how rich or poor you were, if you led a good life, you would have a good afterlife. If you didn't, then you take your chances. Um, it didn't matter if you were the emperor of Rome or a labourer in the fields, you would die just the same. So here we have, on a level, um, the skull hanging representing a person. We have the scepter of an emperor on one side, and we have the stick of a beggar on the other. We have a butterfly sandwiched in the middle, which is a symbol of the human soul, and they're all sitting on the wheel of fortune. It's a nice introduction and perspective to the people I'm going to say, because in this case, the physical world was as important as the invisible world. So. Physically, where were we nearly 2,000 years ago? This is a map of the small Roman towns that occupied Suffolk, with all the dots representing a general distribution of fines, villas, and other settlements. You can see in my rough green circle on here, um, there's only a very sparse distribution in this area. Um, it included villas at Ruffham and Hoggart's Green. Um, this is probably because we're in a geological area known as the Till Plain. They're quite rocky soils that are formed in part by a section of an Ice Age glacier breaking off and melting over the landscape, at which point it dropped the really random mix of rocks, sand and other material it picked up on its journey onto the local landscape. 
Um, and because of this, the soils were quite hard to farm. So the villas and the villages had to have very large estates and working populations in order to make them profitable. Great Glenethan sits just to the west of a Roman road, round between Pakenham to the north and Lord Melford to the south, which is this road here. These were recognisable Roman settlements with substantial infrastructure. They often began with fields, um, they had a huge amount of industry, including pottery kilns and metalworking. And more importantly, they sat on a road that connected the major urban centres of Caister by Norwich in Norfolk, which was the inherited capital of the Iceni tribe, and the huge Roman urban centres, Chelmsford and Colchester in Essex, were almost like capital cities of Roman Britain. If you're ever driving along the A131 and you think the road is very straight, it's because parts of it still follow the Roman road. If we come closer to the village, and I can thank Google for flying over while we were all digging, to show that in addition to harvesting all your data, they can go back in time as well. Um, you can see the Roman road passing at the bottom, down here. Um, the settlement we're looking at today, Sigglesmere and Great Will Neatham, is situated in a fork in the river. So we have one of the high courses of the River Lark coming through here, and one of its small tributaries, the fork across the landscape here. Um, so we're enclosed on two sides by watercourses, which would have provided water for drinking, laundry, and a host of other necessities. It would also provide a rather interesting perspective on some of the later results at Fenton's Farm. In the yellow circle, um, you can see I've marked the postulated extent of the Roman settlement here. Um, but you can also see I've marked on finds of coins, pottery, and a kiln that suggest activity was much more wide-ranging. I'll get to Fenton's farm at the south here very shortly, but I'm going to start slightly further north at Erskine Lodge, um, which you can see is at the northwest riverside edge of the settlement. Excavations by Allen Archaeology recorded an extensive spread of features that are consistent with this northwestern periphery of the Roman settlement. These included nearly 300 pits, including two wells in the southern part of the site. Um, the wells had traces of wooden linings or internal structures which may since have rotted away, which if you can just make out are the shadows of colour at the bottom here. Um, the other pits, um, many of which were excavated for sand and gravel, for the, um, presumably to provide for the village buildings, um, and were subsequently backfilled as rubbish pits with use of um, pottery and animal bone tipped into them. The main village was probably located to the east on ground slightly less affected by the rivers, but we do have some seemingly rectangular arrangements and lines of posts. The one we look closer seemed to be a wood frame building, which is what I've marked over here. Um, amongst the rubbish on the site were iron nails, door hinges, keys and window glass. So we know there were more substantial buildings very close by. The other big feature on the site was part of a former channel of the River Lark. So I marked on earlier where the current river is, but this one we have a much earlier branch of the river coming through the site here. At the base of this river we found scatters of flint work um, that suggests it was open about 3,500 BC. But more importantly on that, we found three distinct layers of Roman silts and material dumped in the river on top of it. Um, interestingly, the material from the river contained mainly metal objects, worked animal bone tools, and fairly high status pottery it was very different from the material in the rubbish pits. This suggests the material wasn't just discarded, but was rather deliberately placed and deposited in the river, possibly part of a votive offering. Now, almost as a teaser of what's to come, also by the river's edge, and perhaps highlighting it as a very important boundary in place and time, um, and also very separate from the domestic settlement, we had three unadorned graves and two cremations. The grave on the left hand has its head resting on a pillar of stones, um, while on the eastern side, on the right hand here, we had graves with scatters of iron nails in that suggest they were buried in coffins. In the middle, 
you can see that the site also contains several complete animal burials, um, including dogs, a calf, and a pig. Now, across Erskine Lodge, we had a lot of less glamorous finds, which included lead and ironworking fragments, pieces of furnace lining and metal tools, all related to industrial activities you'd expect to find on the edge of a settlement. And mainly, you'd expect them to find there because it meant that nothing else would catch fire. Um, but most of the exciting finds, of which there were plenty, came from the colder and wetter deposits of the river. In total, there were over 1,000 metal objects recovered, including over 200 coins, which ranged from the middle of the 1st century to the 4th century, so telling us the settlement lasted for the entire Roman period. Um, only one coin of these was silver, a denarius in the top right corner here, um, and I'm very looking, much looking forward to seeing which emperor this belongs to. There were 14 brooches, two pins and chains for clothing, um, most brooches had a cruciform profile, um, but I rather like, on this top left here, this rather charismatic cockerel. Um, and this appears to have been thrown in, if not fallen in, whole. It still has a working pin on it, and if you had a tunic or a shawl you'd like to fasten today, you could quite happily do so. Um, but I pause at this rather mundane explanation. Um, because the presence of just one striking rooster in such good condition may rather crow of something more. Um, roosters were associated with personalities or aspects of several different gods. Chief amongst them was Mercury, um, the messenger. He connected different levels of existence, the divine, the mortal, and the afterlife. He was a chaperone of souls, and so perhaps this being thrown into the river was no accident after all. Um, the rooster was also associated with other gods, like Minerva for readiness, and possibly owing to their rather cocky nature, Mars for their fighting spirit. But personally, I like Mercury. <laughs> At the bottom here, you'll also see a very tiny copper spoon. This wasn't an eating implement. You often find these called toilet implements in the Roman period, and what they were actually used for is probably cosmetics. Um, the Romans certainly used plenty of makeup and similar applications and remedies. Um, and again, it's a relatively valuable item to just casually throw away. Most of these items weren't broken, they're still very functional. But what I'm stuck with is why people would willingly deposit such items in a river, especially something so transient as water. So I come back to memento mori. Why would you want to ensure your good mortal combat, combat, mortal conduct ensured you a good afterlife? I guess it comes down to why a good afterlife or the belief in a good afterlife would be so held on to as an ideal. What did it promise and why? The final and striking find from Erskine Lodge was this iron band and hoop on the left-hand side, top and bottom here. Or more precisely, these were slave shackles. Large agricultural estates with poor soil would have required a lot of labour, and some of that would almost certainly have been slaves. Some of them may have been shackled permanently, but more likely it would have been a form of punishment. Slave shackles are mainly found in rural areas, generally to the south of the line between the Wash and the River Severn. It's a pattern that matches another phenomena that I'll come to later in this talk, and I suspect not by coincidence. In this part of Roman Britain, you had a lowland villa economy, but that said, also included the skeleton on the right-hand side here from France, simply because it's one of the very rare examples where you actually find slave shackles on a skeleton. If you look carefully at the bottom here, you'll see there are iron hoops around the ankles. Um, though I should say, after finding this example from France, there's another example from the Walbrook River in London recently came up. Um, so I ask you, if this were a slave, or indeed a lower class free man, working a hard life of agricultural labour, it would be worth persevering, wouldn't it, for a happier afterlife? <laughs> 
It's a promise that you find in an awful lot of religion, I think, still today. Now, leaving behind uh, Skin Lodge, um, moving down here to Fenton's Farm. This is on the southern edge of the modern village and perhaps the Roman settlement too. So I'm going to start away from dead people. I'd like you to focus on the blue lines I've got on here. The ones zipping across the site here, which correspond to this plan, and this section coming through here. This is a section cut through a very large ditch. What we have here is a large boundary, up to three metres wide and two metres deep. Completely separate from the archaeology, it also shows you what we were digging through was really pure yellow-orange sand. Um, but why are we so bothered about a ditch? This ditch runs nearly parallel to the stream that feeds into the River Lark, and it's nearly perpendicular to the main river. It's only 250 metres away, if there wasn't an ancient course of the river even closer. Now, as I started with, if the rivers formed two sides of the settlement, then perhaps this was the third side of a triangle. Um, it also points the shortest distance to the Roman road. This all suggests a very well organised and a very carefully laid out landscape, all very normal. Um, but when I come back to my different worlds ideas and what makes this difference, in the old river channel we had the conspicuous presence of some very interesting objects, just as we did in this boundary ditch, which all goes to show that the boundaries were very important. The ditch has a fair quantity of freshly broken pottery, including suspiciously high proportions of very high status, glossy red Samian ware, which I'll come to in a moment. It also had quite a lot of coins, unfortunately not as many readable because they haven't been sitting preserved in water. Um, there was also this copper alloy knee brooch, so called because of its shape, it also has like a kneecap on the end here. Um, and much like our earlier rooster, this brooch is in absolutely full working order. You can still use it today. It's got an unbroken pin, an unbroken spring. All it needs is a little polish. There was also, in the middle here, a leopard brooch. Um, it would have originally been inlaid with blue and yellow enamel. Um, the Romans like to incorporate animals in art, so we need not be symbolic. But it rather becomes so when I tell you there's less than 20 examples of this type of brooch from the entirety of Britain. Um, returning to gods, Dionysus, or Bacchus as the Romans called him, is often shown riding a leopard. He was the god of the grape harvest, wine making and fertility, not that one necessarily follows the other. Um, generally, he's a good time god, he's associated with drinking and a fair amount of debauchery. But again, it comes back to kind of practices you might associate with both agriculture and funerals. Normally, I'd speculate that this amount of jewellery and dress fittings were associated with a villa or high status occupation. But here it appears to be a much more gradual accumulation of objects deliberately sacrificed by a rural population into a river and associated boundaries. They were deliberately offering up items of wealth. Another item, in the very middle here and on the left, was an Itaglio ring. This has a blue stone set in the centre and a very small figure carved into it. I don't know for sure who this figure is yet, but again it's likely to be mythological. One of the prime candidates is Ceres, the actual goddess of agriculture, grain crops and again fertility, which seems to fit the same pattern we have here. I mentioned showy pottery, and I'm going to pause briefly, partly because, aside from being a, an umbrella archaeologist, I'm also a pottery specialist, so I have to include this because I love it all so much. <laughs> this is Samian ware. It's high status, glossy red pottery that was made in Lazoo, a factory like industry in central Gaul. Um, it's near modern day Clermont Ferrand in the Auvergne in France. One of its interesting facets is that many were stamped with the name of the maker, and that these names are closely datable, similar to coins. Here we have 
stamps of two men named Ilia Maris and Sacrilus. Their Latin names are slightly abbreviated, and the MA at the end of Ilia Maris stands for Mali, the Latin for made by, um, and it's where we still get the word manufacture from. Um, these two stamps date to the second half of the second century AD, about 150 to 200. And we suspect that by the end of this period, a large boundary ditch had been backfilled, which is very important for what happens afterwards. And before the narrative of this makes me leave the pottery behind, um, sailing wear also took the form of intricately moulded bowls. I've included a complete museum example in the bottom right to give you an example. Each bowl has a very individual design, and to me, these provide another interesting link between the real and the mythical worlds. In an age long before television and special effects, a rural population would have had very limited sight of fancy carvings and artwork that we associate with the classical world. Most images would have likely been on jewellery and pottery. This bowl has a repeating motif of sphinxes, the head of a human on the body of a lion with the wings of a bird. Potters had thousands of figures at their disposal, and who used which figures and how they would be combined can be decoded to identify them. This bowl was likely the product of a potter named Katusa, and he worked at the same time as our two stamped examples. Returning to the colourful shapes on my plan, these are grapes, um, and as you can see, they're spread across the site of Fenton's farm, including into the top of our boundary ditch, which had been filled in by the time the graves were dug. Based on a couple of the artefacts I'll discuss, we believe the graves were cut in the late 4th century AD, probably around or after about 370. In total, we have 54 inhumation burials. Now, the different colours on my plan, you don't need to remember, but what they represent are the varying different positions and treatment of the body. If a body is not simply laid out straight on its back, we tend to call these deviant burials, um, because they're different from the norm. But what makes this group so special, which you can see by the variety of colours and styles going on here, is that the deviancy appears to have become the norm. We don't know why this was the case, but I have a few ideas that I'm going to discuss as I show the different variations we've recorded. Before we delve deeper, a quick note on our general population. When we came to look at our skeletons, there was quite a pronounced pattern. We have a fairly even and typical ratio of men to women. They're a fairly average height for the period. However, the age range is far from the typical civilian population, and frankly is distinctly skewed towards the older age brackets. This is likely a very real statistic, and it actually reflects a relative lack of children, um, or possibly that all those of prime or young age have been deliberately moved on, and this might be consistent with our use of slave labour, or a rural population. If you wanted to sell somebody as a commodity, and at this point everything and everybody was owned in some way, then all the value was in the younger people. That said, ageing skeletons is very difficult, and it's rather complicated by the fact that if you have a very hard life, it takes an incredible toll on your body. I'm sure there's a few of you that can attest to that here. Nobody that will admit it, I'm sure. Um, the impact on a body might actually reflect both the age and hardship of the skeleton. So our villagers were quite put upon. <laughs> Discovering the skeletons was quite problematic. I marked on the plan the location of the graves, but most of these were only evident when we actually got down to the level of the skeleton, which you can see in this working shot. Um, normally, when you look at the ground, after the subsoil has been stripped away, you can see a dark rectangle, like a doorway into the earth, that shows us where the grave cuts lie. Unfortunately, as I mentioned with our ditch, we were digging into almost pure sand, 
sand that was backfilled very rapidly after the grave had been dug. So there really was no colour difference to see. So effectively, we had to reduce the level of the site very carefully, layer by layer, and work our way down through the sand. Form of total excavation, if you will. The engineers were thrilled when we told them we were going to have to reduce the level of their site by about a metre and a half more than we expected. Um, it was also complicated the fact that several graves appeared to be intercutting or laid over each other. And by the fact that the Romans, they could be quite creative with where they placed their skulls or what they did with them. Wait and see. As we worked through the first skeletons, we were very surprised by the preservation. Sand is naturally quite acidic, and it's generally not kind to bone, often making it very soft, often dissolving it. What sometimes all you'll find is the shadow of an individual in the sand. Thankfully for us, in the ground, the skeletons could be excavated carefully, starting with the head, if we could find it, and working our way down the body. Normally, I say to people at this point, archaeologists don't use paintbrushes to brush away sand, to brush away soil. We just don't use paintbrushes. But here, the sand was so fine and so pure, we actually could. It's not quite Egypt, but it's maybe as close as we'll ever get. Once we've exposed as many bones as possible, we have to record them in detail. Every skeleton has to be not only photographed when it's in the ground, but also drawn by hand with careful measurement. Once this is complete, we can lift the bones. We usually split the body into pieces, partly because it's easier to pack, but more importantly, when you come to put it back together, it's much easier to realise where things go. So, left arm, right leg, torso, head. We bag them all separately. Unfortunately, the true acidic nature of sand also meant many of the bones started to crack as we lift them, so they were very fragile. But thankfully, well preserved enough that we can start to give them a forensic examination for age, for health, for cut marks and wounds on the bones. Very often on Roman settlement sites, you find small numbers of burials, often groups of two or three that sit in isolation, probably within the grounds of a residence such as a farm or a villa. However, it quickly became clear we were dealing with a more formal cemetery area. And this fits with what we understand of a settlement, um, and also of Roman law. Formal burial grounds had to be located outside the boundaries of a settlement, possibly because of hygiene, possibly because they drew a very clear line between the living and the dead. However, they were normally situated immediately outside settlement gates and entrances, or often along roads, because they were intended to be viewed visible parts of the landscape. Remembering the dead, and for some, displaying who they were and what they stood for, was an important method of communicating, both for those who came to visit the settle, settlement and more spiritually. Um, there may have been grave markers or wooden monuments visible once upon a time, maybe visible from the road, from the river, or from the settlement itself, but all we have left as archaeologists are the graves. Now, after all that, and talking of an older population, um, I'm going to enter the graves with this body. Um, laid out on his back, with his arms folded over his chest, he's about 16 years old. He's quite short for his age. Part of the reason we can tell this is that there's a very delayed fusion of many of the bones as he grew. This suggests he may actually have been quite malnourished, and we can't speculate more on the particular cause of death. Next, we have a more typical member of the group, a middle-aged man, he's about five foot seven, which is actually at the taller end of our population. You can see how well preserved the bones appear in the ground, including the frontal teeth. <coughs> However, he actually has a moderate degree of tooth loss, he has quite progressed degenerative joint disease. Both of these traits are common in our population, probably a combination of high physical stress, poor nutrition and illness. Essentially, that hard agricultural life I was referring to earlier. We often have signs of infection and abscesses, especially in the teeth, 
which have healed considerably before death. Similarly, osteoporosis um, is quite often observed in the bones. Um, so our rural populations clearly had to work very hard, consuming a diet that was far from luxurious. That doesn't explain one thing. Although this body looks complete, when we looked at the fractures of it, there was a perimortem fracture at the time or around the time of death around the skull and the upper vertebrae, the bones that attach to the skull to the neck. He actually appeared to have had his head removed and placed back in its natural position for burial. Now, as you can see, this burial is from York, um, and it's to show that this wasn't an unknown practice. We use the term perimortem to mean around the time of death, because we can't tell if it was just before the cause of death or just after. If it's just after, it's most likely to be part of a burial practice. Part of the difficulty in this is that after death, bone gradually becomes more brittle. But for a while, it maintains a degree of flexibility, so you can't be sure when the cuts or the wounds were made. Now, the analysis of all the bones is still in the early stages, so this is all very preliminary results. Um, Many of our burials were clearly a little different to simply being laid out. As I said, deviant. Um, this brings us to burial practices, or if you like, a form of social theatre. Um, as many of our skeletons were much more obviously placed in different positions, or indeed decapitated. These two middle-aged men were buried prone, or face down, Nonetheless, the bodies are very carefully placed, with the heads facing one side and one arm raised. It's not unlike how I sleep most of the time. Um, they do have slight evidence of malnutrition. One of them has an incredibly thin skull that you normally find on a young child, but he's a fully grown man, so he probably had a very poor diet while growing up. Here we have two female burials. They've been very carefully placed in a crouched position. Again, that sort of allusion to sleeping is quite clear. One is about 10 years old and has quite a lot of evidence for infection on new bone growth, which again suggests serious illness. The other is quite old, has many healed fractures and possibly an amputated right hand, suggesting incredibly strenuous knife and something that would sort of crushed or fallen on the hand. Despite this, we have to say they're very carefully placed in the graves. Now, the word funeral has a Roman Latin origin. It was the word funus, which was used to cover everything from the hour of death to the very last post-burial ceremonies. Now, different classes of funeral had different titles. I'm going to try and get this right. Funus translaticum was for the poor or ordinary citizens and it ranged all the way up to Funus Imperatorium for the Emperor, and there were many different ranks between them. Now, Roman legislation suggests these different ranks would have allowed you to have different ceremonies. They also imply that different people might have had to pay for your funeral. Some citizens may have been allowed to lie in state for up to seven days. But if you were a poorer member of society, would you be allowed such luxury? Could you afford to be away from the fields? The burial rite brings me on to two intriguing additions to graves. The first is this middle-aged lady whose skull is resting um, and perhaps partly enclosed by a pillow of stones. Um, you might remember we also had another burial with a pillow of stones um, up at Erskine Lodge. So clearly there's a, there's a few similar burials in the local area. Rather more fondly, I like to think, this older lady was buried with the skull of a dog resting at her feet. It was only the skull, which does raise the question of whether the dog represents a sacrifice 
whether it represents a working animal or even a pet, or whether, in fact, it was a symbol that was intended to accompany her as an animal into the afterlife. Now, we come to the headline-grabbing bit of this talk, um, and if it isn't tactless, the increasingly headless part of this talk. This middle-aged lady was quite obviously decapitated. The skull has been placed by the right side of the legs. She was in quite poor health, with very serious tooth loss and degenerative joint disease. More importantly, she had unhealed cuts, perimortem, to the third and fourth vertebrae beneath the skull. The immediate conclusion people jump to is, this person must have been executed. But returning to our classical beliefs, there is a pattern that might have much more to do with the treatment of the body during the funeral. All Roman funerary practice was influenced by two basic notions. Death brought pollution. It demanded that the survivors commit acts of purification. Secondly, that to leave a corpse unburied had very unpleasant repercussions on the fate of the departed soul. Finding the occasional decapitation burial in a Roman cemetery is not unusual. They appear more common in rural areas in the 4th century AD, and despite my northern friend here, they're most common in southern Britain, south of a line between the Wash and the River Severn. It's a pattern that you might remember mirrors the distribution of slave shackles in Britain. Um, you can also see here um, the illustrator rather likes to use a red crayon. Um, I suspect these were actually a lot less gruesome. Um, part of the preparation of a body would actually have involved a draining of blood, um, and it probably would be of like cutting the throat, which may also be responsible for some of the cut marks we find on the necks. Um, you also notice this burial from York, shackles around the feet. Now, as we continue to discover more and more decapitated skeletons, that's where this cemetery becomes really very important to archaeologists. Finding such a high proportion of decapitations and deviant burials is very rare indeed. <coughs> this burial is of a middle-aged man in poor health. He had incredibly bad osteoarthritis in his hips and knees. Um, so far, we have 15 clear decapitations, and the more bone analysis is completed, and the more cut marks we find on the vertebrae, this number keeps going up. At the moment, over a third of the skeletons have been decapitated, and at least another third are deviant in a different manner. The cut marks are typically just to the vertebrae, and suggesting a fairly neat incision from the front of the body. Although we do find occasional damage to the mandibles or the jaw bones, which may indicate some chopping from the back. Now, this chopping is often taken to indicate execution. But why would you execute so many people in such a relatively isolated area? Or why execute possible slaves or labourers who are far more valuable alive, even in poor health? As an aside, um, just to the skeletons, but very much pertaining to what they look like, the Latin word for head is caput. And capitis amputatio is the removal of the head or decapitation. Now I know it sounds a little Harry Potter-like, capitis amputatio, um, but it's actually where we get the words capital punishment from. Um, now, decapitation was actually reserved in the Roman Empire for free men who were Roman citizens, as most of the well-to-do in the provinces in the 4th century were. However, if we're dealing with slaves and lower class population, most of these people, were they to be executed, would have been crucified or burnt, not decapitated. <coughs> 
Um, it's also worth noting that Christianity had become the official religion of the Roman Empire in the fourth century. So it actually mainly passed an era where people would be persecuted for their religion. Now, across southern Britain, it's notable that decapitation burials in rural areas predominantly appear to have been cut from the front with a very sharp, fine blade. Um, and they often have a very high incidence of people with osteoarthritis and degenerative joint disease, just as we have in this cemetery. So as I come to another middle-aged to older lady, and this pattern becomes very clear, we have to ask, would a particular part of a lower class population, possibly slaves, behave different if they weren't being executed? Now, one clue might be more of this rather dry Roman legislation. It allowed for the formation of various clubs and associations that did not affect politics, law and order. They included burial clubs, or as they were known, Collegia Funeratisia, among the lower orders of society. These groups would collect a monthly subscription, so when one of their number passed away, quite unpredictable at this point I suspect, they could observe the correct rites and ensure members of their community passed through to the afterlife, even if, as an individual, they might not have been able to afford it. This doesn't explain decapitation, but it might demonstrate why we have such a collective behaviour. Here we have um, several middle-aged ladies with additional decapitated heads. I'm not going to suggest anybody had two heads, but the, uh, the placement is no accident. One suggestion is that the removal of the head was part of a process of purifying the body, um, as required by Roman tradition. Now, Christianity may have been made the official religion, but it's highly unlikely these were Christian burials. And the belief in cults, um, the belief in the many Roman and indeed local gods, was far more likely to have been retained by many of the lower class population. Later Christian literature is also open to the process as a way of stopping reverence rising from the dead. So it could be the action of a rather zealous group of converts. Again, cult's behaviour. However, the Roman Empire, as we started with, sprawled over a huge area of Europe. And decapitation burials are quite rare everywhere else. They're a peculiarly British phenomenon. Um, and that's a distant frontier province. So the practice probably wasn't brought in from anywhere else. So it's much more likely to represent a regionalised cult rather than a wider religion. <coughs> Sticking with the Fenton's farm skeletons, this one has a combination of deviancy. Um, it's being both crouched and decapitated. I don't think it's designed to look like it's running or kicking the skull, but <laughs> it certainly looks quite barbaric. Um, he's actually a fairly old man. Um, he has quite severe dental abscesses and osteoporosis throughout. But he's more notable for the fact that he has fractures in his hands, his arms, his ribs, except they're all very well healed throughout his life. These are the kind of injuries, probably not through combat, but the kind of things that, if you're working with wagons, um, harnesses, horses, it's the kind of injuries that somebody might suggest through that very hard stress working life. Buried in a similar fashion was this older lady with equally bad health. She was a little confusing to dig because there were plenty of extra bones scattered in with her which turned out to belong to this grave. This middle-aged lady, or rather all the remains of her, um, is a former grave that may have been cut into the last grave, but I actually suspect they were placed on top of one another in a single episode. Um, this is perhaps more likely because if two people died in close proximity to one another, our burial clubs, still of limited means, might have had 
very low amounts of money and time, so it would be very simple to put two bodies into one grave. And on that theme, we have this rather tangled bunch. <coughs> now, we don't have extra skulls here. All the skulls do belong to bodies. Um, these actually include three men that were buried together. One in his late teens, one middle-aged, and one old. Interestingly, all three have bones that suggest they were quite malnourished. Um, the youngest even had an asymmetrical skull, probably, again, a poor fusion of bones when he was young, possibly even a difficult birth to an equally underfed mother. You would have noticed, as with my graph earlier, there's quite an absence of children in these burials, which is unusual given levels of child mortality in the period. But we did find one striking infant. This is the burial of a three to four year old child. And you can see the, the scales in this are about a metre long, the longer scales. Um, like many of the adults, the head has been removed and placed between the legs. Um, decapitation burial of small children is not unknown, but it is incredibly rare. It's hard to countenance that this would represent an execution. And it supports the fact that the adults weren't either. Furthermore, the child appears to have a condition called cribria orbitalia, a swelling of tissue within the cranium of the skull. This is widely accepted as an indicator of anemia resulting from an iron deficient diet, or because the body couldn't absorb iron because it was ill, possibly due to parasites. Therefore, it appears that the burial was actually done with a great deal of care to ensure the progression of this child into the afterlife. And I see no reason why that same level of communal value wasn't applied to the adults. Another absence you would have noted from the burials I've shown, and in stark contrast to the first half of my talk, is the absence of any artefact. Most of the graves were completely unadorned. But two were accompanied by these very distinctive and fragile bone cones, each with a separate plate um, down the middle, fastened with iron rivets, and very finely carved teeth. If you look very closely, you might be able to see faint carved decoration on the spine. Possibly just in the middle here. Um, while these combs could certainly be used for grooming, um, they were very much accessories designed to be worn in elaborate hairstyles. 